Welcome to the Remote Instruction Plan Technical Support Webinar. In today's webinar, we will be discussing components 6, 8, and 9, which are aligned to instructional planning, components 10 and 14, which address diverse learners, and component 15, which is, addresses limitations um, to your remote instruction plan. This is Pam Bachelor of Digital Teaching and Learning. Before we get started, we just wanted to welcome everyone to WebEx and go over a few housekeeping items. During this webinar, you will have um, access to chat. In order to turn on your chat in WebEx, you will have to click on the icon that looks like a chat button or a thought cloud, and it will turn blue. When the icon is blue, your chat is on, and you'll be able to see it on the right-hand side of your screen. There are two audio options in WebEx. You can use your computer audio or you can call in. If you need help getting started, there is a link on slide two uh, to a getting help guide for WebEx. We're gonna pause for just a moment to go over the links for today's session. First of all, there is a slide deck link. Uh, we do want you to have the slides open um, throughout the webinar. If you would like to go to the, the bit.ly right now, it is bit.ly forward slash ri webinar three. We also have a questions Google form. Um, we're asking that you place all questions in the Google form. This will help us um, with contact information in case we need to get back to you with further information. The questions form will continue to be live after this webinar, so even if you're viewing the recording, you can um, submit a question using that bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash R-I questions. You will also notice that the link to the questions form is on the bottom of every slide. So please, as we go through today's webinar, if you have questions, please submit them using that bit.ly form um, and we will get back in touch with you as well as stop periodically throughout the webinar to address questions. I'm now going to take a moment to introduce our leadership team of folks that have been working hard on this remote instruction plan guidance. Uh, we have Sneha Shah Coultry, our Director of Advanced Learning and Gifted Education, Dr. Angie Molinix, Director of Innovation Strategy, as well as the Interim Director of K-12 Standards Curriculum and Instruction, and Dr. Vanessa Wren, Director of Digital Teaching and Learning. We will hear from all three of our leaders later on today, and we appreciate their leadership as they led an interdisciplinary team of stakeholders from across the state, as well as interagency staff from multiple divisions. So we thank them for their leadership during this time. We also have a panelist, uh, several panelists from across the division, as well as um, stakeholders from across the state to share their expertise with us today. So we have Beth Cross, our state consultant for advanced learning and gifted education. Christy Day, our section chief for English language arts and languages. Jamie Fry, our principal from Claremont Elementary School in Catawba County Schools. Nancy Magnum, associate director of professional learning problem, programs at the Friday Institute. Trey Michael, director for career and technical education here at DPI. Lisa Phillips, a state coordinator for the education of homeless children and youth. Sherry Thomas, the director of an exceptional children's division. Latricia Townsend, Director of Federal Program Monitoring and Support Division. Zatley Stocks, an ESL Title III consultant for the Eastern Regions of the state. Thank you to our panelists for being with us today and sharing their expertise as we discuss the various components within the remote instruction plans. We also want to say a big thank you for all of you who are listening and joining us in this webinar today for your hard work and dedication uh, to support public school students during the pandemic. And we are here to support you during the reopening of schools. Uh, so we are here and we are, you know, wanting to help as much as possible um, as we plan for the reopening of schools this fall. Just an overview of the remote instruction plans. All public school units are required uh, to complete a remote instruction plan that covers the 15 uh, components. 
Um, this plan must be due by July 20th, 2020. Um, and it is your framework for developing quality remote learning for future COVID-19 disruptions. It is based on um, Senate Bill 704, as well as State Board of Education Policy SPLN 006. We do have um, our full document uh, with the remote instruction plan guidance, um, and that is linked on this slide here on slide nine. If you click on this picture, it will take you um, to the full document, which has the guidance for all 15 components, as well as our communications um, with recording links and slide decks for our previous webinars. We have had um, two other remote instruction plan webinars, so this is our third one. So we welcome um, you to go and look for those resources as well as links um, to previous webinars um, if you have plan questions about other components than the ones we will be talking about today. All right, at this time, we're going to go ahead and get started with remote instruction plan components 6, 8, and 9 um, for instructional planning. And talking to us about components 6, 8, and 9 are Jamie Fry, the principal of Claremont Elementary, and Nancy Magnum, the associate director of professional learning programs at the Friday Institute. Component 6, developing effective design and delivery of remote instruction lessons within professional learning communities. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. As well as what we know makes best practices um, in just good teaching and learning, but we had to look closely at that remote learning component. And so you'll see here that there are um, the, the seven components that we feel like make up that um, that effective delivery um, and design. And throughout component six, each one of these um, areas offers an opportunity for you to really dig in um, and, like Vanessa said, working through your PLCs to support each one of these. Um, a little bit later on today, we're going to talk more about instructional time as well as feedback on student work. Um, I know you all are all concerned and thinking about social emotional learning um, as well as the equity, choice, and flexibility. Um, component um, weighs heavy as we think about our design for remote learning. Um, also later on today, we will talk more about student engagement aligned to standards. But the resource, um, and we'll put a link in the chat, but you also have it on the slides. The resource here really goes in depth um, into what each one of these components focuses on. So just know that this is here and that these, um, that these design principles are a great starting place as you think about what do you want teaching and learning to look like in your district under um, or during remote learning. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, coming in on this next slide, I want to talk to you about another framework that really pairs very well with the North Carolina Instructional Design Principles for Remote Learning, and that is the Blended Learning Teacher Competency Framework. So the way that this framework is organized, it gives us a great way to think about, uh, measure, and implement uh, this evolution to blended learning that we're looking at across North Carolina through this remote learning experience. So the four domains of that framework are mindsets, so talking about buy-in like we just heard, uh, qualities of a blended learning teacher, developing the adaptive skills, so those generalized skills that help us problem solve and find solutions where those unknowns are, right? That's where we are right now um, as we develop these plans. And then finally, the technical skills, which is where we really hone in specifically on that task and domain know-how, the mechanics of day-to-day uh, -day remote instruction, blended learning, and what that looks like. So on the next slide, um, I'm gonna just give you a quick example of what one of these competencies broken down looks like. So technical skills is one of the easiest ones for us to look at on a high level because it is very specific uh, and it's easy to digest. So for example, um, under each competency or under each domain, there are a set of competencies. Um, and within those competencies, um, when we think about design and delivery of instruction, we see standards, um, and you can sort of think of these like NESIS standards uh, that you can use as guideposts to plan for remote learning with uh, teachers and administrative staff. So for example, understanding and managing the face-to-face -face and online components of lesson planning within a blended course. 
questions that you can use to plan for that, and then coaching strategies as well. Uh, Dr. Jamie Linton, author of the Blended Learning Blueprint for Elementary Teachers, um, did a lot of work on this uh, framework to add the coaching piece. So it's a valuable tool that we're also sharing uh, as a resource today. And on the next slide, um, there are a few considerations, key considerations that we want you guys to consider in this limited time that we have um, for design and delivery. And so first, PLCs. Um, I think that we talk about PLCs by name uh, quite a bit, but the actual implementation of a professional learning community, having that collaboration with other staff, asking what do I need students to, what do students need to know how to do, how do I know that they've learned it, that, that was important before, but it's even more important now as we figure out how to communicate clear learning goals and targets that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, on. Uh, but that is important. If you don't have that, uh, now is the time to do that. Offering opportunities for staff to share successes and brainstorm trouble spots because we're all human. Um, and throughout this design, design and delivery process, um, you know, we, we have a lot of strain as we try to implement, um, you know, the, in response to the virus, these new practices in teaching and learning. So opportunities for staff to share successes and brainstorm trouble spots are super important. Um, virtual walkthroughs, this is something that Miss um, Mangum and I discussed that I think is very important as well. Um, having walkthroughs to be able to share um, and elevate uh, best practices for remote learning and what's working within a school building is great because people are gonna come along, just like we know from the definition of blended learning, uh, students, we expect our teachers to have our students at different time, pace, path, uh, place um, in terms of implementing blended learning, but we really need to be doing the same thing for our teachers in terms of acclimating to remote learning. Uh, so having virtual walkthroughs to be able to share feedback and elevate best practices is a great idea to implement as well. Uh, finally, weekly submission of lesson plans for review against expected frameworks um, to kind of distribute that work with other admins and support staff is important as well. <clears throat> So we do have some resources for component six here that we have that you can share that um, expound upon the things that I just talked about and that Nancy did as well. Jamie, Nancy, thank you for sharing. Um, very good information there and resources that will be available to you. The next instructional component is component eight. And component eight is communicating learning targets to students on each remote instruction day and ensuring that the lesson design provides instructional time, practice, application to demonstrate learning, including a process for monitoring. So the most important thing here is all students have to have clear learning targets, particularly when they are remote. I call it my Hansel and Gretel framework because you need to lay out as many breadcrumbs as possible. So when students are separated from you by time or space, they know exactly what they need to do. So things that you would consider with your learning targets and communicating those are posting them daily for students to see, discussing with students at the beginning of the lesson exactly what they need to do, and reviewing with students at the end of the lesson to, in, to informally assess and monitor their understanding. So the whole part of this component is shaping your lesson design and communicating those targets in a way that students, their parents know exactly what needs to be completed when and exactly what they are learning. And I am gonna turn it back over to Nancy and Jamie and they will give you some hands-on applications. All right, thank you, Vanessa. Um, so we will start um, by showing you, we've broken down the three uh, into three sort of separate components, the, um, the component that we're about to discuss. So we're gonna start by talking about, um, on the next slide, communicating learning targets to students on each remote instruction day. So one succinct example um, that I like to share is being, thinking very systematically about how you are communicating learning targets so that students can reference back. Because what's different about this work um, is that we've got to have some sort of concrete representation that students can refer back to if it's a paper packet that they have these learning targets in uh, with instructions on where they need to refer to each day of instruction, um, or if it's virtually in, in a hangout with a, their teacher. Um, having the work done on the, the front end to be able to share that um, with students and be able to connect them to that, uh, that really 
deep content connection within the standard is critical. So um, here are some examples of the ways that our teachers did that this year. So you can see here a vertical alignment between RI 3.8 and RI 4.8. So this is our template that we use for unpacking our standards, but we also take it a step further and we unpack those standards into what we call learning progression. So if you're familiar with Marzano's work, you're probably familiar with proficiency scales. Uh, I could be speaking Greek, but uh, all that to say, it's basically just the standard um, being broken down by individual skills in the order of least complex to most complex um, learning goals for students. So it scaffolds appropriately. Um, this is something that we put in front of students because research shows that students that can tell you what they're learning perform 27% better than students who can't, and that's Marzano as well. Um, so it's, it was extremely critical to, for this component for us to make sure that we kept this in front of our students. So this is an example of the vertical alignment, kept the same format and the expectations, but this was something that we used to plan backward uh, with our students. And now I'll turn it over to Nancy. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. You know, I think you, um, you know, you um, alluded to this in, in that um, students have a lot of learner agency, I'm sure, in your school. But we also know that that learner agency um, is important during face-to-face -face as well as remote learning. And so I think um, when I look at um, that first part of, um, of component, of the component um, eight, I think about learner agency and students being involved um, because they need to understand their learning targets. And so I think that that's so important. Um, as we look at the next slide and think about the second part of component eight, um, this is the really, th this is the design portion that comes in for teachers in that it's the instructional time, um, the practice and the application components. And so, you know, if we go back to, um, when we first started teaching, this was kind of the the, the Madeline Hunter or the or the thick of our teaching, and um, this we have to go back to this as we design our remote learning plans and think about what um, what guidance are we going to give our teachers? Because um, I had a principal say to me um, during the spring, he said it's kind of like everybody's a first year teacher all over again, um, and we really all have been. And so, how can we help that? So let's on the next slide you'll see um, that's just a call out from that remote learning guide that I, um, um, the design principles that I referred to at the beginning of this sec uh, of, um, of today that you have the link to. And um, there is a whole section in there on instructional time expectations. And I think that it's important, again, to go back to learning science and remember what we know about the brain and specifically what we know about the brain in an online environment. And so um, it's important or, or we recommend that you pause after five to 10 minutes to give students time to reflect or to kind of switch the channel um, to assess their level of understanding or to give them a quick break because we know that um, we can only hold our attention during passive instruction for so long. Um, we also might want to switch the modality of instruction, maybe moving from, if we're doing something synchronous, we want to move from maybe a lecture to asking people to respond in the, in the chat or um, to share some of their ideas um, and breaking things down into man manageable chunks. I think breaking it down into manageable chunks, if you remember nothing else um, in your instructional design is probably one of the biggest um, keys. So on the next slide, here's a great example of a structure of a digital mini lesson. And um, Kristen and Katie, um, this is Kristen Zemke and Katie Muteris um, who put this together. But I think um, it says digital mini lesson, but I think we could think of this as any mini lesson. Um, and that providing teachers some type of structure like this can be really helpful um, as you think about your remote learning um, plans. And you can imagine how this simple um, structure could fit into any subject or across um, really any grade level with a, some kind of greeting or connection, some kind of um, teaching, a showing, having students do something, and then an opportunity for them to keep thinking and coming back because we know that that's important as well. So that's a structure of a digital mini lesson um, and it kind of breaks it down and we could even help teachers think about how much time for each one of those um, actual portions. Um, again, going back to Vanessa's comment at the beginning, during PLCs, this would be great for PLCs to, 
to have conversations about how are we um, breaking this down for our students or how are we on um, the timing of it, of our mini lessons. On the next slide, we'll see um, an opportunity. Sometimes we wonder about, okay, if we're, if we can't do something synchronously or if we're providing packets for students, we still need to help give guidance to parents or to students about how to break this down for them so that they're not sitting and trying to do work for two hours at one time. Or, um, and so on this, it's an example of what a paper packet, maybe it's the top um, piece of paper of a paper packet or of um, a Google Doc that um, is, is sent electronically to students. But it helps students and parents um, to see that how to break this down. So maybe they're going to read the article. That should only take about seven to ten minutes. Then you see the switch modality there in blue um, where you're asking students to tell somebody or write it down. What did they learn? Then they're going to continue reading the next part and then summarize the learning, maybe even using a graphic organizer. Then there in blue, you see a break, um, a brain teaser or, or a quick send me a hello video to the teacher. And then, um, you know, showing that the, um, they should complete the assignment within um, less than 30 minutes. So providing that kind of opportunity or breakdown could be really helpful to, um, to parents or guardians, or even to a student, to a high school student, to help them better understand about how long. Um, I'll also mention that along with that paper packet, something that we've seen this spring um, in many of the schools that I think has provided an opportunity for a little bit more connection is putting a QR code on the front of that packet with a short video introduction from the teacher. Um, we know that many of our families um, have access to at least the internet um, via their cell service and so they could scan that QR code with the video on it and watch the video of the teacher explaining something even if they're not able to join a meeting synchronously. So hopefully that gives you some ideas about um, providing guidance for your teachers with instructional time and practice and how to help students um, apply what they're learning. Um, again going back to those instructional design principles there is a lot of guidance there um, around the, the design and the, the time ex, um, expectations that hopefully will be helpful for you. On the next slide, we'll go into thinking about um, the process for monitoring the quality um, of remote instruction materials. So this past spring, um, I've heard a lot of people say this was kind of this past spring was like emergency learning, right? Or, I mean, maybe, it, you know, maybe for some of us, we got to remote learning, but it was like all hands on deck. But you're having the time now to develop a plan and to um, spend a little bit of time thinking about, okay, what is the quality um, of, the, of the materials that we have? And how can we um, best support or utilize um, the best materials and help our teachers access those materials? And so something you'll see there on the next slide, this is, um, is a rubric that might help you look at the, um, the resources that you're utilizing and um, kind of evaluate again with, with your team, with your administrative team, with the district level team, and even at a school level um, with, within PLCs about the materials that you're using and the um, and the types of instruction that you're using. And so this rubric um, is part of the resources that we have there, but some of the questions there, um, we're, we're looking at how are we um, sharing content and within the resource, maybe, maybe it's a um, particular piece of software that you've purchased. And so is the content um, accurate and adequate and age level appropriate? Um, is the technology purposeful and reliable? Um, is the is the design um, of the of the piece of technology even motivating or clear and, and user friendly? And so, really looking at what are we utilizing and how are we utilizing it, um, and is it actually effective? Um, and or do we need to look for something else? What are our gaps? Is an important piece as you look at the bigger picture of your remote learning. And so on the next slide, you'll see some key considerations. You know, within component eight, there's a lot to consider, but um, as we think about this, I think less is more. And we have to identify those power standards. Jamie talked about breaking down 
um, and unpacking the standards. And I think that that's going to be really important as we not only think about what um, where our students are based upon the spring and coming back to you in the fall, but as we go into the fall, um, because sometimes when we're more self-directed, um, we can't expect you know that we're going to get the same amount of learning in. Um, and so how can we identify those power standards? Um, again, utilizing our PLC structures, can't say that enough, that if you haven't established those, I think establishing those and really getting some norms um, and opportunities for those PLCs, um, giving people the time and the expectation that those PLCs are going to be key. But um, using those PLCs can help you with the um, high quality lesson development. And then this is a really important one um, that we need to think about how can we utilize our instructional support staff to elevate resources and to help curate content and provide professional learning. I think this spring we've all recognized the importance of our media coordinators, of our technology facilitators, of our special educators, of our, um, our ELL um, or ESL teachers, and um, many other support staff that have been key. And so how, um, how are leaders making sure that teachers and PLCs have those opportunities to collaborate with instructional support staff, whether at the school level or the district level, um, to help support them in that design. We do have um, that, that resource there, that quality review tool um, for digital learning resources that um, on the next slide, you'll see that. And of course, then going back to the, to the resource we first shared with those instructional design principles will be um, a, great, a great resource for you with component eight. So I'll pause just for a second and see if Jamie or Vanessa have anything to add there or if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Um, one of the taglines you've seen a lot is this is a time to keep it simple. And um, Nancy, I think you talked about that when you said identify your power standards. Um, so you want to make sure you're focusing in on those primary wins and um, that you are um, setting yourself up for success and setting your students up for success. One of the questions that have come through the chat box is will there be any um, professional development offered. And uh, so I want to go ahead and address that now. Absolutely. There's several things that will um, continue. If, if you've been part of the NC Learns Together, um, we will continue that with a total focus on how to teach remotely effectively. And um, so it'll be a virtual courses that we will be putting together and continuing just like we did since March 13th. Another, another training opportunity I want to make you aware of is that we have partnered with Friday Institute to um, create some remote learning coaches. Our plan is that we will um, open that up so every LEA can have one person that is trained in how to support teachers and instructional support staff in remote instruction. We hope to get that out in July um, and have that going through October where you will be building capacity in your district with one person who goes through deeper training in what is effective remote instruction and then how do I coach for that in my, in my LEA. And then I want to also bring your attention to a MOOC that is available right now through the Friday Institute, and um, it is called Teaching Remotely. And Nancy, correct me, but I believe there's over 1,500 participants signed up for that MOOC right now. And um, so that will be another avenue. There is also some professional development coming out of our um, curriculum and instruction division as well. And I believe there was some communication about that this past week. We plan to take all of our available uh, professional learning offerings and harness those together in one platform so you, it's not fragmented. So you will see all of those shared with you in one place. And uh, but the learning continues. I will also share. I've talked to several LEAs who are utilizing Matt Miller's online course. How do you teach remotely like a rock star? Um, so that's another one, too. And you might have seen that we actually link that in one of our resources as well in the remote instruction document. Um, so that is there. 
I want to lift up another question that has come through on the bit.ly and it's an excellent question. So I've just got to hit this and this question comes from Columbus County Schools. Kelly Jones and she asked, how do you see the seven design principles and the new required ITSE student standards interacting? And um, so I want the pause there to see if anyone wants to say anything that they don't about that on the panel. I will jump in and, and answer that myself. Vanessa. Vanessa, this is Nancy. Um, I'll just quickly say that I think I think there is um, definitely a connection there. Um, we haven't we haven't specifically crosswalked it, um, which might be a great opportunity and 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 thing for us to do and maybe create that graphic. But um, you know, I think that when we think about the um, ISTE standards um, and the standards for students, um, I think that you know. Students um, with learner agency is really important, and I kind of mentioned this before with um, as students understand the standards. But I think that um, that learner agency is a big piece, um, and is also part of those um, design principles because we know we want students involved in um, and taking an active part in their in their learning. Um, I also think that the you know kind of running throughout this is the digital citizenship and the um, and so I think that that is another big piece um, that, you know, while it might not be addressed directly, I think that we um, are teaching those standards to our students and, and, and um, figuring out how do we all work together, um, whether synchronously or asynchronously um, in a digital environment. And some of us have been doing that before when we were face to face, but we're all kind of faced with that now. So. And I would echo what Nancy said as well. Um, I think that whether or not we crosswalk it, I think we're going to be, as we facilitate remote learning, we're going to be implementing these standards anyway. Um, because as I think about them, they're so focused on student ownership and agency, like Nancy said. Um, I think for us to facilitate remote learning effectively and, and really have good teaching and learning happening, especially if we wind up at any point in, in, during the next school year going fully remote again for a period of time, um, I think that all of those student standards will absolutely be implemented. Thank you, Jamie. I will echo that. Um, as you review the ITSE digital learning standards for students, they are inherently part of remote instruction, universal design for learning and student agency. If you're not familiar with those, they are empowered learner, um, digital citizen, knowledge constructor, innovative designer, computational thinker, creative communicator, we're certainly doing a lot of that, and a global collaborator. Um, so they are very inherently embedded inside of remote instruction and how that that will go forward. So great question. Vanessa, we also want some other questions that have come up in the chat have to deal with power standards. And so Dr. Mullinex wants to clarify power standards um, and DPI's role. Angie? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Singha. Um, yeah, so just to touch on standards um, as we move into the fall um, semester and whether that is plan A, B, or C, um, regardless of what that looks like, we do want to be mindful uh, that we are planning out the year as though um, that we are teaching all of those standards um, to fidelity. So we will not, as a department, we will not be identifying um, particular power standards. Um, and I do know that there are some LEAs across the state who um, have that approach to that, but from a department level, we will not be um, identifying those. Our guidance is that as you're mapping out the school year and what that looks like, um, that you will you will be sure to address all of those standards. Now, certainly, um, you know, some carry more weight than others do. Of course, we know that. Um, but just making sure that we're mindful of the fact that we want to really focus on the current year's standards. So um, if it's a rising fourth grader that we want to focus on those fourth grade standards, um, that may still mean that we need to uh, pick up the pieces um, from some of those learning gaps, but we still want to make sure we're, that we're staying on grade level for those students. And again, uh, making sure that we are teaching all of those standards to fidelity. Thank you, Sangha. Yeah, 
So we are going to move on to component nine. And component nine is the last instructional component that we will discuss today, but it's a very important one. And this is the component, and this is, the, again, all these are required, ensuring that remote instructional time, practice, and application components support learning growth that continues towards mastery of the standard course of study and including work measurement guidelines appropriate to each grade level including deadlines for submission of assignments and methods to assess and grade learning during remote instruction. Wow, that is a many parts to this one, but it's incredibly important that the instructional time, practice, and application supports that total picture to student learning and continuing towards mastery. Um, one of the things that um, Nancy will talk to you about in a minute is those instructional time expectations and a remote learning setting will differ from a traditional face-to-face -face setting. And your considerations in student time is going to certainly have to take into account the various settings that um, our students will be in. We know that we have students that will be taking care of siblings at home or sharing computers. So um, certainly the time component is going to be very important. And another thing that I want to lift up that is so important when we are teaching remotely is teachers teaching through feedback. When we are in a remote instructional model, a lot of the one-on-one -on -one teaching that develops is very natural and organic. Students say and parents say that they develop closer relationships with their teachers because of the one-on-one -on -one reach outs that will be involved in this phase. And um, so that regular teacher feedback on student work can greatly impact the student learning and the motivation. When a student knows that teacher is going to give them feedback on what they did and make a discussion out of it, they are much more motivated to stay engaged into the work. So that is even more critical. We we're going to wrap up this component real quickly, but I'm going to turn it over to Jamie and they're going to wrap, share a couple of things with you and then we'll move on to component 14. I oh, know we're going to move on to career technical. All right. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I will try to move swiftly um, through this. So we've broken this component down um, to really two buckets that we're going to talk about on a high level. First is the work measurement guidelines appropriate to each grade level and then the, that mastery uh, aspect. So those specifically those methods to assess and grade learning both formally and informally. So to situate the conversation that we're about to have about this component, um, I was asked to share a little bit about this story of how we um, set the stage for this. <clears throat> So in Catawba County School District, who is, you know, I'm so blessed to be a part of and be a principal in because we have all just as a team really focused on being prepared and really caring about students and families first uh, and establishing equity. We had one week between the onset of remote learning and the closure of schools. And in that one week, um, people, if anybody ever said that this work was, wasn't possible or couldn't be done, they were making excuses because it happened. Um, and I, I think it happened well across the state. <clears throat> so equity and access to learning is kind of thinking about the how. So this is John Carter's uh, framework for managing change on the left. So the big opportunity in the middle was that transition to remote learning. So we had to make, make it through all of these elements of how we were going to ensure that we were doing high quality, high fidelity uh, learning experiences, how we were measuring student mastery of those outcomes, just like we had done a week prior. But then we also have to make sure that in this transition, we don't lose sight of the critically important parts of a successful change process. And that is the Noster model on the right. And kudos to Nancy and the Friday Institute for introducing me to this model um, several years back. I am a huge fan, but um, this model shows you uniquely so how if you are experiencing frustration or resistance or anxiety, it will pinpoint and tell you exactly what you need to fix, exactly what is missing. And I think this framework was pivotal to the work that we did. So on the next slide, um, a cliche or a metaphor uh, that really stood well in place for us was strike while the iron is hot. Now, please no full disclosure. I'm not asking anybody to strike your home iron while it's hot. Um, I don't know what would happen. So please don't do that. Um, but rather on the left, when iron is hot, it, we strike it because it's malleable, right? So it's this idea that when you have a hot iron on the next slide, 
you are really working your way into this window for maximum impact. And that was that one week for us when things were still uncertain and people were unsure and didn't really know what to expect. We took that time to communicate early and communicate often um, with students, with parents and, um, and the like. So to ensure success of mastery, quality feedback and, and remote instruction, you have to address these things first. Uh, and I'd be remiss not to mention it. So parent and family communication. We had parents that didn't have internet access. Um, we called, we surveyed, we got in touch with our families and, and figured out the devices that they had, the internet. They didn't have a device, we got them one. Our, our district was amazing about that. Our uh, internet access, we hooked up families with Spectrum internet and had installations that were free during COVID-19 um, so that they could access the online learning. So we made no excuses and our teachers were all in um, to be able to get them connected. Maslow before Bloom was something that we talked about a lot as a staff, and that was also focusing on food insecurity, home visits to do well checks. If we weren't hearing from a student or weren't engaging a student, that was super important. And as a result of that, we had greater than 90% engagement during remote learning uh, for almost the whole time in a school with 70% free and reduced lunch population. Um, so specifically on work measurement guidelines in each grade level, one of the easiest ways to think about this is the uh, personalized learning pillar framework that we have in the state of North Carolina. The one that I'll call your attention to really quickly is the competency-based progression model. So specifically, we're talking about students mastering topics at their own pace by demonstrating what they know and what they can do. Those are really the two big components of it. The teacher's role is to monitor progress through various assessment types, and then providing differentiated support. That's just high quality core instruction. So the Aurora Institute, formerly INACOL, who actually created these blended learning uh, teaching competencies that I talked about earlier, have five elements of what they term competency-based education looks like. So students advance based upon demonstrated mastery. Um, competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives that empower students. Assessment is meaningful and is a positive learning experience. Students receive timely and differentiated support and students develop and apply a broad set of skills and dispositions. Next slide. So there is no real secret sauce to, to doing competency-based education that is not on this slide. I think from personal experience, um, this is the key. The high quality PLCs, which uh, we talked about earlier, focused on those do four, the do four model questions. What should students know and be able to do? How will we know if they've learned it? And what will we do if they don't? I think that that is, again, even more important uh, in remote learning as well. And then two, unpacking those standards for mastery. The framework that we use is the Wiggins and McTie framework. I'd say that's probably the most popular one. But here I've outlined some steps. I won't um, belabor those steps at this point, but you can go back and refer to those steps for how we think about unpacking standards specifically uh, in the context of that do for framework. But without these structures in place, like I said earlier, it really becomes difficult to provide quality feedback on students' true mastery of the standards. All right, so then we have a few examples to share. Um, at uh, Claremont Elementary School, um, we implemented learning plans and progressions. Um, so we have kind of a, a running check on students' um, level of mastery of the standard rather than just did they master the standard or did they not. Um, so those learning progressions there where we just literally take the skills, the language within the standards, and we pull them out and we create these clear learning goals. That's a part of that, uh, that specific process on the previous slide. So um, you can see here, we divide those learning goals into proficient level, developing level, and emerging level, where they're really not even ready to begin thinking about this because of prior gaps. Um, and we, of course, put out vocabulary and resources as well. And you can see the unpacking uh, document for North Carolina is um, screenshotted down there at the bottom as well as a resource. This is another example um, from another grade level. Again, um, I won't uh, belabor these, but this is a, an older grade level example of that. And then on the next slide, in example three, <clears throat> you can see what this looks like from a student facing perspective. Um, so the we developed learning plans and pathways uh, for our students that were on different levels. So what you're looking at is an on grade level um, student pathway. There were three of these each week. Um, and our teachers basically took, like uh, somebody was talking about UBD earlier uh, and planning backward, we literally just took these standards, had the proficient skills, the developing skills from prior grade levels, and then the emerging, 
uh, put those in and then chose activities that would be uh, be helpful in demonstrating mastery of that standard. Example four is another example of, um, of the 3MD3 standard on picture graphs and bar graphs. And that is the last example in that part. I'm going to turn it over to Nancy at this time. Yeah, great. I'm just going to quickly talk about um, methods to assess the grading, both formal and informal. On the next slide, you know, I think that we all know this, but it's just important to reiterate that um, understanding what our student is mastering helps us to plan instruction. And so when we think about that instruction on the next um, slide, we have several ways to assess, um, you know, formative assessments, and we have a, our digital tools can provide us great um, methods for um, thinking about those formative assessments to understand where students are and what they're, um, what they already know. Um, you know, I think that there is also um, opportunities not just through um, through digital means, but we also have to think about those. Um, those offline ways that we can provide formative assessments to better understand um, where our students are. On the next slide, this is just a good reminder that um, really the purpose in all of this is about feedback, right? It's not to assign someone a grade, um, although you know we will be assigning grades, but it's about feedback. Students crave that feedback, both the formal and the informal. Um, we all do, and so good feedback is specific, it's timely, and it's constructive. So, um, because feedback doesn't necessarily mean tests or grades, um, there are some great ways that we can provide that feedback. You know, if, when we're face to face, we provide feedback in a, in a number of ways. Sometimes it's just a thumbs up. Sometimes it's a you know a, a verbal comment um, to a student, but they're getting feedback constantly from us, and so we have to figure out. Um, for our remote learning plans, what does that feedback look like when we're not together? And so using our LMS um, for discussion forums um, for our older students, and um, we can give feedback to students, but students can also get feedback from one another. Um, I think that's one of the things that probably most of our students have missed, or one something that many students have missed the most during this is the feedback they and socialization, the collaboration they get from their peers, um, but also using digital tools. On the next slide, um, there's just a few examples of both both um, digital as well as offline um, ways that we can provide that informal feedback. Um, holding the office hours for specific topics um, is a great way um, to to give feedback and to allow students to ask questions. And that off, those office hours can be by phone or um, a digital platform like this. Um, but we can also use collaborative documents that can be asynchronous. Um, like Seesaw or Padlet and ways that we can give feedback. Um, the next slide you'll see here is an example of just offering that feedback um, to a student and explaining exactly what, um, why they got it wrong, not just that they didn't get the answer right, but that they, um, why, um, and you'll see that kind of here in the pink. And then I think of, as we think about more formal feedback, the next slide, um, this was from Jamie's school, their weekly report card. So helping um, parents as well as students, we talk about students having to know where they are and what standards they're covering. Students need this, and so whether this is um, through PowerSchool or other, like, other opportunities that you're um, communicating this, or if, if it's something as simple as this type of graphic organizer or um, document that you're sending home for students. Um, that they are getting that feedback on what's missing and even just notes from the teacher um, and how they did. So um, a couple of key considerations is just setting those clear expectations for offering um, feedback. What will, what will we do as a district and how will we be consistent? Um, thinking about considering the student learning environment and offering flexibility is also important and uh, um, speaks to the, our equity component as well. Um, considering phoning students into synchronous meetings if they don't have internet access or they don't have a device. So um, how can you give them that phone number to call in or how can you get them to be a part of the group? Um, and um, using teaching assistance to offer feedback to work with small groups um, can be 
a great way or support staff. There are a few resources there on the next slide and um, those documents that Jamie shared. Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. I am going to turn it over to Katie Michael. He is our State Director of Career and Technical Education, and he's going to talk about some of the um, innovative ways that you can continue your CTE um, courses. So, Mr. Michael, it's yours. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, just wanted to thank you for the intro and for having us on today. Uh, to talk a little bit about CTE and response to remote uh, instruction for CTE. Uh, and I, I just wanted to echo and reinforce all of the strategies we've heard today and, and really commend our presenters on this high quality work. It, it truly will make an impact on all of our students, including CTE. Uh, these strategies are all applicable to CTE instructions uh, in our schools. Um, of course, we, we all know, though, that CTE is a mix of content knowledge and hands-on performance-based instruction. We cover career-ready topics from equine science and veterinary assisting to HVAC and plumbing to financial planning, culinary arts, and nursing fundamentals. CTE is, of course, well-positioned for remote learning and particularly uh, competency-based progression just by the very nature of our content and how we aligned to our business uh, and industry partners, their standards and their indicators. Uh, and we do use a number of their resources that I'll touch on in just a moment. But one of the things that we've done in preparation for much of this is onboard a, a number of series of what we've called collaboration stations. Uh, they've been typically one to two hour sessions with teachers that uh, are very much like the office hours that have been going on for the agency. We've been doing this since um, uh, the first uh, couple of days that we were out of uh, school and out of our office. Uh, they've been very successful. They've provided a lot of comfort to our teachers. Uh, you know, many of our teachers are, are not very comfortable uh, in this uh, dynamic world and just need uh, a little help understanding the resources that are available to them. So we've tried to do that. We will continue to do that as we progress throughout the summer and into the fall. We, of course, uh, also have a lot of help from our vendors and our national partners that have provided uh, really high quality resources uh, from, th from groups such as NCCER, Microsoft, ASE, uh, MBA Research, and the list goes on, uh, of folks that have really stepped up to provide content uh, for our teachers to use in their classrooms with students so that they may be successful and, and get uh, ready for uh, a career or college uh, of their choice. This year, our summer conference will be virtual. Uh, which is, of course, a big, big shift. We all know how uh, that will be when you take 3,000 people and put them online. Uh, we're excited that this year we have worked out a deal with, with East Carolina University, who is our partner in that uh, endeavor, that uh, this year there will be no cost to the participants. So if you have teachers or friends that uh, are not aware of that, please help them understand that we want uh, any and all comers that, that need help uh, in CTE instruction to attend our virtual summer conference for this year. We will be convening two working groups soon uh, after summer conference uh, is concluded to really help us drill down in many of the same manners that we've heard today, uh, but particular to CTE. So we've got a group of career development coordinators that will be coming together uh, shortly uh, after our summer conference to talk about our work-based learning strategies uh, and our policies and procedures. Uh, and how they've been impacted with COVID-19 and how we anticipate them possibly even being impacted this next academic year. So they will uh, embark upon the path of, of uh, hypothesizing potential questions, pitfalls, uh, and things that we can address early on and develop strategies to help our local uh, stakeholders uh, to do the best work that they can do for students and provide those high quality work-based learning opportunities. The second group we will onboard will be a group of local administrators, which will really help us think through uh, these three key critical questions here, such as which courses can uh, best be adapted from remote instruction, uh, and specifically even what content within each course can be adapted for remote instruction. Which courses may really truly uh, depend on synchronous instruction, uh, and of course, again, drilling down to which cor uh, course standards may need synchronous instruction. 
And then finally, really starting to think forward about how uh, in a new environment, we can help our local leaders understand and advocate for teachers and students uh, to schedule lab time uh, for uh, the hours that they need in their classrooms for carpentry, masonry, electrical, et cetera, or even our clinical hours in our health sciences area. So really looking forward to uh, bringing those groups together, providing more information as, as we get closer to uh, August 1st, uh, and helping our teachers onboard uh, and embark uh, into a very dynamic, uh, but yet we believe exciting time for our students. Thank you for having me on. Thanks, Trey, so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. This is Sneha. Um, we're so glad you have stuck with us. We have remained at a steady 208, uh, 208 participants, and, and we're grateful that you're with us. What we're gonna do now is shift a little bit um, from the general instructional planning, which really has to be able to move from plan A to plan B to plan C, and in particular for the remote instruction plan. But now into um, uh, diverse populations that need to be addressed specifically. Um, after the instructional piece and while the instructional piece is being developed, we must continue to think of both our exceptional children, our, our students who are homeless, our English learners, as well as our AIG populations. And so the next section of our time with you today is gonna look into each of those groups um, and then we'll come back together and touch on the limitations generally um, and have some closing comments. So, um, uh, we appreciate uh, Sherry Thomas being with us today, and she's gonna review with you the component 10, um, which really looks at our uh, 504 students and our students with IEPs. Uh, Sherry, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Sneha. Um, as uh, we've all seen, component 10 really does ensure uh, that students with disabilities, students with IEPs, and those on a 504 plan do have access to the curriculum through their required accommodations and instruction. Um, from our division, we have been trying to provide guidance um, since early in March and have shared all guidance that has come from our Office of Special Education Programs, our special ed arm of the Department of Education. And that last guidance was on March 21st. But within that guidance, it really stressed that we have to provide FAPE um, that is very consistent with what the student should have been receiving, but in the framework of how that remote learning was, was going on. And so our guidance has always started since March 13th with ensuring that we're looking at the health and safety of students, families, teachers, and educators, and that that's first and foremost under the consideration because the last thing we need is to provide services that are going to put any of those entities in harm in any way. And we know some of our students with disabilities, and especially those uh, who may have an IEP, may be medically fragile. They may be those really hard to serve kids because of their medical needs. That becomes even more important as we're thinking about remote learning and their access. Uh, we have tried very hard to follow um, guidance that's been given from the CDC, from DHHS, and from our through our executive orders with Governor Cooper to determine how we are to provide that instruction for students with disabilities, maintaining that that. Uh, requirement from OSEP with the consistent being consistent with the need to protect health and safety of students. Um, IDEA and the provision of FAPE does not eliminate the ability to serve our students through remote instruction. Um, the key is to ensure that it is, it is accessible to those students. Um, we tried again to, to reiterate that, that uh, thinking through our guidance that we are making sure it is as appropriate. I'm gonna give you a quick example. 
um, a teacher may be delivering remote instruction and she has or he has assigned a reading passage, but that they also have a student who is visually impaired in that classroom and they're home with a device, but it doesn't have um, the reader capabilities on that. So the student can't see the material that's been provided. So you have to think about what options might work for that student to still access that same instructional material. Is it an audio recording? Is it the teacher recording it and sending to the student to listen prior to the classroom discussion? It's what we do face to face in classrooms all day long. When we're remote learning, we have to really think about that as well. Can that student access the instructional information that's being provided? That is not to say if um, one if all students are going to get a uh, PDF copy of a book, that means that the EC student must also get that. They just have to have access to that same instruction. So it doesn't have to match one for one. It just has to be accessible. And you've probably counted by now the times I've said accessible because that's really the key. Can they reach out and grasp that information and utilize it to continue their learning? And that's really, really the key. Throughout all of our communication, we have stressed that, that the connection between parents and families and the teacher and the administrators is critical because there has to be that communication going on of how that service is going to be delivered, what it might look like, and how it might be delivered to that particular student. Um, if, if an LEA believes they cannot serve that student, then they really do have to work with that parent to collaborate to determine what that next step might be or how they might modify to ensure that that instruction is deliverable. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So we put out earlier from our division some um, guidance to think about as you are looking at remote learning. Uh, key is that collaboration between the special ed teacher and the general ed teacher because about 80% of our students are in general ed more than they are in special ed. So making sure those services align, those schedules align, they don't compete, they're doing it collaboratively. Um, Knowing that the expectation is not that we can hold school from a remote learning standpoint, hour for hour, minute for minute, that we can when we are in brick and mortar schools. Special education instruction has to be adjusted just like general education. Making sure that teachers um, are making that good faith, reasonable effort to communicate and, and, and collaborate with the parents. Um, some of the communication I've gotten where parents are concerned is because they did not hear from that teacher before the instruction started. So they didn't know what to expect. They didn't know how they would be expected to support their, their child. Um, it, it created a disconnect to begin with. It, it eventually worked out with most of them, but Having that conversation ahead of time, that preparation, that planning. So almost planning with the parent like that special ed teacher plans with the general ed teacher is critical to making remote learning be successful and benefit to those students. Uh, we've also encouraged from the EC division that staff maintain logs to provide that communication to show where they talk to parents. Uh, from an EC director standpoint out in the local districts, it also helps that person determine how to support the school when additional services are needed, when extended school year might be considered, or if there is a complaint and comp ed is required, compensatory education is required, that's a log to go back to to determine what was being delivered, how it was delivered, if it was effective, if adjustments were made. It's really a protection for both the teacher and the school if that log is maintained as well as the communication log because that's really, really critical. Um, there have been lots of resources pushed out from the agency from from DPI and within um, the, the early materials that came out, the exceptional children division also created a supplemental optional remote learning resources for students with disabilities. I'm going to drop that link in the chat if you have not found that. It is a, a website or a, a Google site where we continue to update resources 
to provide additional information. Um, as we are finding new materials or new accessibility, that is continuing to be updated. And it would be appropriate for students with disabilities with an IEP or students who may have a 504 plan. And I think I've covered it all. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you, Sherry. Um, another group of students that we also need to address um, in the remote instruction plan, um, it has to do with our English learners, our AIG learners, as well as those students who've been identified and are served under the McKinney-Vento Act as homeless. This piece was actually not legislated, but our state board felt like it was critical enough that they added it to the policy and have made it an additional requirement, just like um, component 15, which talks about your um, accessibility and other um, limitations for remote instruction. So right now we're gonna have Dr. Christy Day um, and her team uh, talk to you and discuss with you about English learners. Christy? Thank you, good afternoon. Um, we are here to talk a little bit about English learners and how you can make sure that their needs are being met during blended and remote learning. We know under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that public schools must ensure that English learners can participate meaningfully and equally in educational programs. Um, L programs must be calculated to ensure that L students are able to access and participate in their program just as their never English learner peers do. Um, it's really important to consider their needs. They have very unique needs that um, must be considered as you're creating your plan and as instruction takes place. We have a couple guiding questions for you to think about, and then Zatli is going to speak a little bit about resources. Thinking about our guiding questions, as you are creating your plan, it's really important to think about what those unique needs are of English learners and how they can be addressed and met during remote learning days. Um, you know, when we went into remote learning in the spring, teachers worked so tirelessly to make sure that English learners had what they need and that they were able to access the content. We definitely recommend as you're going through and thinking about these guiding questions that you connect with and talk with your L coordinator and teacher leaders in your district about what they saw in the spring and how they can inform this plan. You also wanna think about the LIEP and how that can be adapted during remote and blended learning. Definitely think about ESL teachers and how they're being included in the planning and the delivery of remote instruction. They bring a lot of expertise. So how are they being pulled in to partner with content teachers to talk about the needs of those English learners so that English learners are seeing the are accessing the content across the day with all areas with all teachers. And then, of course, another important question to think about is how are you making sure parents receive communications written and oral in a language they can access? So how is that information getting home to parents in a way that they understand, you know, translation, translators? How is that playing a part in um, your plan for remote learning? I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Satley Stocks, who is ESL Title III consultant for the eastern part of the state, and she's going to speak talk through some resources that we have that should be extremely helpful as you think about your plan. Thank you, Christy, and thank you everyone, today's attendees, for your leadership to help ensure that English learners, immigrant and migrant students receive equitable service during remote learning and also their families. We really appreciate that. So we have a few resources on the slide. The first one is the U.S. Department of Education resources from OELA, the Office of English Language Acquisition. And we love it for you to go and check this website because they have linked all the different resources they have. They have not just the English Learner Toolkit and the Newcomer Toolkit, they also have the L Family Toolkit, the Educational Technology for English Learners, and other documents that might help you see how you can incorporate those supports for those English learners while working on your remote instruction plan. So we have also the toolkits. You can access, there are templates, there are samples, there are different resources you can use from there. And also the fact sheet that was uh, shared on May 18, providing services to English learners during COVID-19. 
and it has different information about entrance requirements, providing services to English learners, use of funding, family and community engagement. So you have this main resource from the federal level, and you will also see the NCDPI website where you can find the guidance for provisional English learner identification. So you will see how we have outlined the provisional pathway. So if you get new students who might be potential English learners, you have those uh, that information to see how you can provide some services and what kind of things you can do and incorporate in your LIP service chart. So we have some links on the slide uh, from our website, our Google site, and the short URL is bit.ly slash NCL's website. And I would like to draw, take your attention to the main page that is for resources for English learners doing remote learning. We have share information from the Migrant Education Program. We have, these are two different programs, the ESL Title III Program and Migrant Education Program, but sometimes we have in the districts the students who qualify for both programs. So they receive services from both programs. Sometimes we forget about this, um, but it's important to have that. And the resource that we have shared will include different updates from the federal program administrators that work for this uh, specific population and things that might help those families that are farm workers, agriculture workers, workers then that you might have that are also identified as English learners. And we also have instructional and learning strategies. And we have many resources if you have technology and you have in your plan in your school district IT plan, in the technology plan, you have determined that you can provide some devices, you can provide internet, but we have also resources in case you have identified some students who might not have access to internet all the time, or they might not have a device. So a lot to no tech resources as well, so you can consider these. And also resources that are PDFs that parents can download on their smartphones and help the kids. And we have, um, also more information with our UNC TV partnership where you can see all the resources that are in the Spanish. And as you know, in the state, Spanish is the uh, population, the largest population we have of English learners. So this is why we have shared plenty of resources in Spanish, not only for the students, but for the families. And then we have, so we can finish professional learning. That's the other information that we can share. And we have, um, resources for your teachers or your faculty. So they learn how to work with English learners during remote learning. What are those scaffolding techniques they can implement to help their students? And we have archives on our bit.ly slash NCL's website, the Google site, from the previous um, offerings we had during the spring while the schools were closing. And then we have our conference that is coming up in July the 14th. So if you go to the website, you will get all this information and you can tag all that. And also, um, well, I see I need to continue. So I invite Lisa Phillips from the Homeless Education Program to share about her program. Great, thank you for the great information, ladies. And thank you for the time to discuss students' experience in homelessness, which will have a new and dire needs when returning to school next year. Currently, with over 35,000 children and youth in North Carolina schools being identified, there is an expected increase of homelessness over the coming school year that even robust homeless education programs are likely to need increased capacity and funding for. Thus, as school leaders, when you are considering your remote learning plans, it will be essential to recognize the fundamental challenges and inequalities that distance and blended learning may cause for vulnerable students and develop a plan that aligns with the law to ensure compliance in the LEA. To prepare you and make a decisions for your remote learning plan about homeless students, I will be going over a series of questions, each with potential activities that you may want to include in your plans. The considerations that are mentioned in the presentation are a requirement in the law and are considered a best practice for schools in serving homeless students and therefore can be paid for with your subgrant funding that is, if you receive it, your Title I set aside funds for homeless students with the CARES Act funding that you may receive or as a blend of these funding sources together. Let me point out that the questions that are located in the guidance document should be used to determine if an expense is allowable. Should there be something I mentioned that you wish to expand on or if you 
uh, want to identify something different that you can specifically um, do to meet the needs of the educational um, needs of your homeless students. To begin with, I would like to provide you with a definition of homelessness. Uh, the mckinney Fento Act is the federal law that prescribes the requirements of LEAs and serving children who have been identified as homeless. The purpose of the law is to facilitate the enrollment, attendance, and success in school of homeless children and youth. The Act defines homelessness as any individual who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, and this would include our students who lost their housing and are living in motels, campgrounds, emergency or transitional shelters, or have a primary nighttime residence that is a public place not designed for or used as regular sleeping accommodations, and that would be something like cars and parks, abandoned buildings, and similar settings. Additionally, please keep in mind that migratory children who are living in these type of settings would also qualify under the law as experience in homelessness. Next slide, please. Since the start of the pandemic, homeless liaisons and LEAs and charter schools throughout the state have been conducting numerous activities that can be incorporated into your remote learning plans. These activities that are listed on the slide have provided support to children and youth experienced in homelessness to be safe, obtain needed educational services and resources, and be connected to your school. So you may want to include them in developing your plans. Additionally, to ensure the identification and support of your students, these activities that are listed are just really mainly a sample of what's what you can do. Pam, would you move to the next slide, please? Let's take a look at some questions to consider when developing your plans. We will start with capacity. The question all leaders should first ask is if the LEA's current liaison has the adequate capacity to identify McKinney Vento students and ensure their enrollment, full participation in school, and that each have equitable access to services. Consideration for your plans would include items like conducting a simple needs assessment for determining capacity. This would be a great place to really begin your plan as it relates to homeless students. You would want to look particularly at your current data and your program needs assessments. They'll really help you to answer this question. As a side note, I do have sample tools that can be used to decide this if you should need something else. Next, designating a school site level liaison or school social worker to increase the LEA's overall capacity to respond to homeless students and to provide training to staff and community partners about the law and communication with school officials as well as district staff can also be conducted. Blending various funding resources can be a perfect marry as well in making these two type of activities occur. The next slide focuses on liaisons and other school staff reaching out to know or to, to known or suspected McKinney Vento students, particularly doing that now and helping them to prepare for next school year. Numerous outreach and communication tools that are available, including the required educational posters that must be in all our schools in the community, is a tool that you can easily put on your website or make available in your schools and in the community to meet a requirement in the law. This is really a, a, a simple step. It's free and uh, your liaisons have already completed most of the posters being out into the community. Working with them to identify other areas where they need to go would help you to meet this part of uh, the requirements in your remote learning plans. Next, making sure that the enrollment staff understand the law and that the processes in place to enroll in students are required for immediate enrollment. Additionally, access to free school meals, as well as assistance with access to distance learning and transportation to the school of origin in schools are open, full or part time can also be set up prior to the first day of school. These are tasks that your liaisons can certainly conduct in order to uh, support the outreach uh, steps that need to take place. The next slide is on being prepared. <clears throat> This dovetails into the last points I made, but the current levels of unemployment it is intimate that all districts will see an increase in homelessness among families, particularly those who have never experienced it before and who lack familiarity with available resources and systems. You're going to want to make sure your systems are in place to identify returning McKinney Vento students as well as students who are newly experienced in homelessness. 
Thus, considerations for your plan may be also to look at district policies, intake and enrollment forms, and disseminate information about your district's homeless program online and through brochures. You can do this by also including these type of items, um, such as brochures, with uh, your food and learning packets, and again, displaying the educational posters that are already a requirement in the lot, as I mentioned earlier. One step that I strongly recommend is assessing the academics of current and former students to determine their needs for beginning the school year. There may be activities you can decide would best meet their needs and support them to have a stronger return to the classroom. The next slide is on enrollment practices and whether your system online or in person uh, is in place to accommodate the needs of families and youth experience in homelessness. Considerations for your plan should be that that they ensure your students' experience in homelessness are enrolled immediately, and that your staff, particularly your registrars and enrollment personnel, understand what the requirements are of the law and are enrolling students. Additionally, ensuring online enrollment systems are accessible and understandable to parents and youth experience in homelessness is gonna be critical, particularly if you have a blended online or um, return back to school practice. The next slide, uh, this section provides activities to remove barriers and retain students in school. Considerations for your plan need to prioritize students for resources such as delivering or mailing supplies to students who lack transportation to pick them up. Expanding the amount and use of your funding to ensure it is adequately to address new barriers and increase numbers in homeless students uh, by uh, making sure that the students experienced in homelessness have a, uh, equitable access to all school activities, whether online or in person. In the next slide, in this slide, uh, if district learning will be part of the reopening, you need to ask if your schools prepared are prepared to ensure students experience in homelessness can access the internet, devices, meals, academic supports, and mentorships. Considerations would include prioritizing students' experience in homelessness for devices and connectivity that you're going to be providing to all students. Looking at providing unlimited high-speed data through hotspots and or cell phone data uh, and minutes in order for students to complete all assignments and stay connected with liaisons, teachers, administrators, and mentors would be allowed. Um, but do know that you will likely need to plan on meeting learning challenges beyond basic connectivity and devices for homeless students, such as providing portable chargers for students with who do not have access to electricity, offering in-person or virtual supplemental academic supports, and maintaining a mentorship relationship with youth experiencing homelessness that do not have a parent or guardian with them. Uh, additionally, you may provide insurance for devices to McGann Evento students. Uh, this would be allowed with any type of funding that you're using, um, particularly because these students may have an increased risk of theft and breakage due to unstable and unsafe living situations that they may be experiencing. On the last slide of homelessness, it's focused on collaboration and to uh, be mindful of other people's time. I'm going to make this pretty brief. Um, I would make recommendations that uh, referral forms are consistent across programs and with your community partners to simplify the process, not only for parents, but to help them in connecting quickly with the resources and services that may be needed. Additionally, having them online would be of value to families and also to really look at your faith-based uh, organizations and civic organizations and youth groups that may be available in the community to support your children should also be included in your plan. At this time, I just want to mention that this is just merely a very quick, sorry about that, we're, we're limited on time, but it's merely a snapshot of what you can place in your remote learning plans and additional more specific um, Information is available, specifically if you work with your homeless liaisons, they can really help you in understanding what's already been done and what maybe the needs are of your students. So please reach out to them as well as my office. Uh, at this time, I will ask Beth Cross to discuss gifted learners and considerations for your remote learning plans for them. Great, thank you, Lisa. 
I hope everyone can hear, can hear me. I just want to remind everyone of the general statute that undergirds gifted education in North Carolina. It's Article 9B. Uh, this mandates that we identify and serve gifted learners, and within the mandate to serve is a requirement to differentiate instruction. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And there are several principles that we need to keep in mind to meet Article 9B uh, requirements and the standards that light the way, if you will, to help guide us through uh, meeting the requirements of this plan. I'm not going to read them to you because I feel like Jamie and Nancy uh, spent a good deal of time setting the stage for us, and this is just reiterating what everyone else has, has talked about. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, the identification of AIG learners is going to look different. They are uh, to, to identify students, districts are often using data obtained from a sweep screen or a, a follow-up achievement test. There are also uh, data gathered by classroom teachers, AIG specialists, and perhaps other staff who use student observations to recognize traits that may lend themselves to the need for gifted services. In addition, as we strive for equitable identification practices, we are seeing meaningful data gathered that reflect a student's ongoing performance in school through portfolios or trends noticed through assessments over a period of time. So the remote learning environment is gonna add a challenge for this aspect of AIG programming, but this challenge can be overcome through collaboration. Data can still be gathered. It will take intentional planning as we've all described. Uh, we can go to the next slide. It is understood that through Article 9B, we must continue differentiated instruction and courses, ensuring that the advanced learning opportunities are provided even in a remote setting. So when it comes to service delivery options based on student need, it's best to consider a range of service options within the program when we're in the building. For a remote environment, the same is true. You know, what is the range of service options that districts or schools will provide remotely, ensuring that they meet students' needs? Now, these services are outlined on each student's differentiated education plan, the DEP, or the Individualized Differentiated Education Plan, the IDEP. And it would be a benefit to revise this document to include the variety of settings within which your students and teachers find themselves operating through the school year. If this information is not included on the DEP and the IDEP, ensure the expectations are communicated well and often. I know Jamie said early, as one of, maybe something to add, early, well, and often with both students and their families, as well as personnel who are providing these services. Some ideas for consistent services begin with the establishment of minimum expectations for personnel working with gifted and advanced learners. This is to ensure that communication is in place, services are in place, and that these are implemented with fidelity as the needs of each and every student require it. The collaboration between classroom teachers and specialists will be important to ensure extension, enrichment, and acceleration strategies are provided for students in a remote setting, just as they would be in person. There are resources I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Communication is key. This is no surprise as the lack of communication causes breakdowns in all aspects of our lives. There are questions provided here for staff to consider when setting expectations regarding communication in the plan for remote instruction. It is vital that AIG staff is included in the planning for remote learning along with personnel across all grade levels. Services for gifted and advanced learners can, can be implemented well when all involved have understanding and the mutual goal to make it happen. Again, the services are outlined on, on a student's DEP or IDEP, and they, that can serve as a map for understanding the services a student requires. Um, and then finally, and as equally important, is the communication with students and their parents and families. There are a variety of modes used for communication as described in the local AIG plans. Um, so the question is, will they all continue to effectively communicate in a remote environment or should more be added? It's something to think about. And so our, for our resources, there are resources provided by the Division of, of Advanced Learning and Gifted Education to help you continue providing services in a remote learning environment. Uh, there are seven advanced learning labs currently available that we partnered with Duke TIP to create. They're on our website. And a group of North Carolina teachers are creating 13 more so that there will be 20 learning labs available for teachers to use with students in a remote environment and to then provide follow up opportunities for student sharing, collaborating, and for teachers and other students providing feedback. 
Now we will delve more in depth in our upcoming webinar on June 26th from 1 to 2 o'clock. That is this Friday and the webinar will be recorded if you're not able to attend. Please register using the link and password provided on the screen. We'll dig into more detail to help districts and charters adapt AIG programming to remote learning. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Beth. And we're going to quickly wrap up with the last component of the remote instruction plan. And this is where we would ask you to describe your limitations that you have had in implementing quality remote instruction. Um, we know that many funding streams have come down very quickly to help mitigate some of those uh, limitations, but they may include things like broadband connectivity, devices, professional development, instructional resources, of course, transportation and child care, and some of the barriers we are facing with school nutrition. So we'd like you to be honest and then tell us about your limitations. And you might even want to describe limitations that you've been able to overcome. Um, but we do want to collect that information from you. I, I want to remind you that we did have appropriations that have gone out from House Bill 1043 um, to help mitigate some of these limitations. We know we know there's never enough to meet the need, but we are so very grateful for the funding that we have received. And um, if you are looking to expand your state canvas or start a state canvas license, remember those applications are due Thursday. That information has been shared with your chief technology officers and your superintendent. So I just want to remind you of that, but please honestly share your limitations. And I think that'll be very important for us to know as we close out. Um, I do want to remind you that we have ongoing technical support Tuesdays. And uh, these will just be office hours where you can log in and ask a question. And uh, we will have different folks that are from the agency online to support you. There will not be a formal presentation, but we will have these dates available for you to come jump on board and get your answers, get your questions asked. And remember, July 20th, we've got to have all remote instruction plans. So thank you so much. We do want to cover one question. I appreciate you all hanging with us just a few minutes over, but there was one question I felt like that needed to be addressed that came up earlier. And um, that is how much time, what are the time requirements per grade or per child? And um, we just wanna remind everyone with online learning and distance learning, there, we don't have set time because every child has different circumstances. Every child learns at a different pace. That's why we've talked about mastery-based learning. And uh, so we have not put out specific guidance, how much time per child. However, if you look on the um, instructional guidance that we gave you, we did give you some samples from other areas that you are uh, welcome to look at but we ask you to always look through the lens of grace and generosity to our children um, because of the limitations that are out there. And uh, with that, I'm gonna see if Sinead has any, has any parting comments and uh, we will wrap up. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I do wanna take just a couple of seconds to thank all of our panelists and most importantly, to thank all of you uh, for your continued hard work. Please know that the department is here to support you in whatever way possible. So just reach out to us. We know we have some remaining questions that we will make sure you receive um, information, um, answers to those questions that you have submitted. We will make sure to get those to you. And again, thank you so much for your very hard work. Um, find some moments of self-care when possible. Um, I know there's a lot to do um, and we will continue to work together and remain flexible to meet the needs of North Carolina's public school students. Thank you, everybody.